Hey there. Welcome to season two of the Artist in Me is Dead podcast. I'm your host, Rhonda Willers. This fifth episode features a conversation with artist, curator, and author Danielle Crissa. Danielle is known for her many books and her 15 years curating, writing, and podcasting as the Jealous Curator. In this conversation, we untangle tangles and discuss integrating the self throughout your creative process. There are so many creative prompt gems for your practice in this conversation. Have your sketchbook, digital or physical, ready to go as you listen. And heads up, during our conversation, there is a movie we can't think of while we are talking about it. It's painful to listen to us work through it. So sorry. But the movie is LA Story, which we figured out after the recording, of course. Also, keep listening through the end. We have a classic long goodbye, and we will definitely have a part two of this conversation, maybe even a part five. With that, please enjoy this episode with Danielle Krissa. So, well, officially, thank you for coming and talking with me and truly taking the time because I know it's like a chunk of time to ask of your day and your energy too. So thank you for that, really. And this for has like- been a long time coming. <laughs> Well, and the only reason I'm doing all of this is because of you and a conversation we had. And like when I asked you, like, can I just pick your brain and your advice around doing it seasonally, the podcast and like that just to try it out? Like, I'm so grateful for that advice because I couldn't like in my life schedule, everything, I couldn't do anything more than this. Like, I just yeah. like wouldn't yeah. be the balance. Yeah. That I no, want. Right I know. Now. And I think that's the key, right? It's like kind of knowing how to do it in bite-sized chunks so that you can still do yeah. stuff. Right. Um, but not be so overwhelmed by, oh my God, I'm, do I have to commit to this for the rest of my life? No. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always joke. The only thing I commit to is a cup of coffee in the morning. Like that's my yeah, only like, like routine. <laughs> I've got my little, I've got my little companion right here. We're committed for about five more minutes till it's empty. <laughs> then it's over and then it's done no more yeah oh <laughs> uh, well I am excited though to talk with you about your creative practice and life and there's so it's such a beautiful constellation of so many things that you do and investigate and as I was preparing to talk with you I was really struck by that and I was also struck by your longevity and so that was something I wanted to talk with you about too today is like how like how you maintain a creative practice over a like through many different forms of expression and also through time. And if we could maybe start with that, I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are about it. Mm-hmm. And what well, it's first been of all, for you. are you calling me old? You're no, old. definitely not. No. <laughs> I'm kind of um, like 80 well, is yeah, old, 80 actually. and 90 are old to me. Like I'm like, if yeah. you're 80, 90, <laughs> then you're old. Everything else before that is young. <laughs> um well in February it's gonna be 15 years since I started Jealous Curator wow isn't that crazy I can't even believe that um I don't know I think for me I just can't not do it yeah um yeah and like I get it's so nice that you said that actually because one of the things I'm trying to work on right now for myself is blending is realizing that the Jaws curator and Danielle Krista artist are the same person. Mm-hmm. I very much separated them in my mind. Mm-hmm. So I see all of the creative endeavors as the Jaws curator, like the podcasts and my books and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever workshops and all that stuff. Th- those are all creative endeavors. I just realized that now, as you said that, mm-hmm. it's feel very separate to me than my artwork. Mm. And they feel so much more far ahead in success and in, yeah, notoriety and whatever that my artwork does. Mm-hmm. But what I've been trying to figure out through therapy, thank you very much, is mm-hmm. how, is to realize that it is all the same, and I'm just expressing myself in lots of different ways. Mm-hmm. And until you said that, I didn't even really realize that. So that mm-hmm. that was awesome. <laughs> thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, but I, yeah, I think I just can't not either be making stuff I've been like that my whole life since I was a little kid like you know Mm -hmm. if I had like an open Saturday it was Mm -hmm. like okay what can I make you know (laughs) and um and then I would get obsessed and work on it for the next three days you know and if it was sewing something or if it whatever it was 
and I'm still kind of like that. And mm -hmm. um, recently in the last maybe five years, I've really um, tried to push myself to get over the fear of trying new materials because uh, yeah. there's so many things out there that I want to try, but I've had this thing in my head that I couldn't, or mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe because it's my my. I mean, I haven't painted in years, but my my BFA was in painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in my brain, that's what counts as art, right? Mm. So I I I actually really don't enjoy painting. I've realized, mm. like, I just don't. Yeah makes my neck hurt like it's, I just don't enjoy yeah. I've never enjoyed it I just forced myself down this path because I was thought it sounded fancy and important right um and so real artists paint yeah yeah real artists paint the rest of us <laughs> are just hobbyists um working on that with my therapist as well but anyway <laughs> and so I've been doing collage for years and years right um but I've always, when, remember when we made our pinch pot? Yes, I still have it. It's on my little collection that's like in front of me while I work because I keep little special objects there, like touchstones. Like this was an important thing to have done with someone. And yes, but yeah, so yeah. tell me about that when you, yeah, when we did well, that. Well, do you even remember what year that was? Was that like 2017, 2018? Yeah, it was probably 2017, I think. Yeah, around 2017. Yep. Yeah. 2016 um, or 2017. Yep. Yeah. And um, what was the name of the school again? <laughs> oh, it was at University of Wisconsin River Falls. So it was when I was River an Falls, adjunct that's... there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still remember the day and... you said yes, and Liz came running. She's like, "She's yes. <laughs> <We're> so excited." <laughs> that that experience was so good for me, and a huge mm. part of it was you. And because mm. uh, my university didn't have. Um, ceramics it didn't mm. have glass it didn't have textiles or anything it was it was actually very like poo-pooed you know yeah like any kind of quote unquote craft. craft material didn't count it didn't belong in the fine art department mm -hmm. and so you know you I mean I thought that was bullshit but it also plants a seed yep. to make you think it's not a real art form or whatever but I right. always always wanted to play with clay um and I just never did so then when I was there and I was there for a week. So I had time and you were like, well, do you want to come to one of my classes and you can make something? I was like, oh my God. Yeah. So <laughs> I made a, the best pinch pot. The best. ever, And um, it's pink and it's in my studio. It is filled with cut out tiny little people. I'll mm -hmm. send you a photo. Of yeah, please do. Um, and uh, it was, and we glazed it. It was yep. so exciting. Yeah. And then I did nothing again until last year with yep. the um, but that's sort of what I've been pushing myself lately is, is to be like, well, I want to figure out play. Okay. Yep. I'm going to go do that. Or I want to try, you know, I don't know. You were doing resin for a while. Like that was new yes. too. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Pouring resin over the collages and now I'm using resin for everything. I wanted to try like sculpture, like sound object sculpture. And it all felt like <clears throat> crazy breaking the rules because I wasn't supposed to be doing yeah. that, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and I'm just trying to put that all back in my brain and be like, all of that was valid. And yeah. all of it has been like my art practice. And it's just sort of, I guess I felt, I felt a little bit lost because it has yeah. been all over the place since, you know, the last maybe three or four years, it's been very much all over the place. Yeah. But I don't think now in hindsight, that's not bad. That's how you, that's how that's you grow. Gravity, right? Like that's right. how you stay curious and you keep pushing and you keep trying things you're going to find the thing that is just you, you mm -hmm. know? That's why I was smiling as you're describing it. Cause I was like getting internally excited and I'm like, yeah, like that's, that's where growth happens is when you're trying something and it feels kind of weird and you don't like, and like to try something new. I know people talk about this all the time, but I do think it's always important to talk about is it feels so awkward when you're first trying something new. You don't have a lit, you're not fluent. My one friend describes it as fluent in the language of whatever it is. So you're not fluent in that language yet. And yet you're incredibly fluent somewhere else. And so how do you build fluency, which then gives you freedom and liberation to explore and do things in a communicative way, like that come with more behind them and, um, yeah, just like I'm doing that with music right now. Every morning I wake up and I um, 
Oh, I get everyone off to school. But then I've been trying to teach myself a song on the piano, which I don't know how to do yet, but I'm working on it. And I play cello. And so I'm playing the song on the cello too. So I'm like working on it in two instruments, trying to learn, but it's so awkward. It's so, so awkward though. And I'm just like, do it every day, do it just a little bit every day. And then like, it's, I don't know what it's going to become, but it will be something. And it's, it's hard to stay in that place of like, when things are kind of unknown and a little up in the air. Yeah. Well, and I think especially in like the world we live in where everything is supposed to be fast and yes. it's like, I, you know, it's like, you just want success right away, like success right away or, or to know it right away yeah. or to know um, it right away first... is huge. I think there's a yeah. real, yeah. Yeah. And especially at this age, it's like, oh, uh, well, I know the other, I'm just looting the other thing. Yeah. Why? I'm why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I doing this? But when I first started really playing with clay about mm, a year and a half ago, the first day I, I joined a studio, a friend of mine owns a studio in the town mm -hmm. next to us. And so I joined her, her studio. Um, I, I don't know if you heard me tell the story that I, mm -mm. I, she opened the studio and I, I just wanted to support her. And I'd yeah. always wanted to try a wheel class, yeah. like a <clears throat> throwing class. And so my friend and I signed up and, um, and uh, <laughs> into the first class, I got so motion sick. Oh, no. From looking down at the wheel. Yes. Like maybe if my work had actually been centered, I wouldn't have felt so like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I no. threw up like five times. Oh, I, God. And so it, the class was every Monday for six weeks. Um, the, so on that first Monday, I got home, was sick, was sick, was sick for a few to like Thursday, I was like kind of vertigo-ish. And so yeah. I called her on Thursday and I was like, so I don't think I can keep doing this class. And I said, but could I do, I Googled it, hand building. I didn't know it was called hand building. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, can I do that? And she was like, yes, for sure. So um, I came and started doing that and mm. it was awkward. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, got a little scratch in my throat. Um, it was awkward. And frustrating because I was like, I'm going to make a flower now. And it mm -hmm. looked like a five-year-old had just made yes. a flower. And I was like, well, that's horrifying. <laughs> but just like you in your music, I was like, I'm just going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the class ended uh, and it was right. I was going to Venice. I teach mm -hmm. a course in Venice during the Biennale every summer. And so I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. So I missed the last class. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was there, so technically at this point, I'm still a collage artist, paper sure. collage. I had this dream when I was in Venice. Mm -hmm. It was so clear. And I woke up and it was, it was basically like collages, but made with objects made of clay yeah. instead of cut out paper. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's what I need to do. So yeah. I messaged my friend. <laughs> it's a nine hour time difference. And I was like, hey, if I'm blah, 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 would that work? And she was like, yep so I said I'm gonna when I get back I want to join your studio as a member and you just pay a monthly fee whatever yeah and so I was so gung-ho and I had this picture in my mind and I got in there and I started trying to make moss and snakes and all these things I yeah. had in my mind and they were so bad yeah. that I didn't even fire them I was just like this I can't even be bothered to like yeah. you were learning so, right you were learning I was learning but I didn't yeah. want to learn I wanted to yeah. know right yeah. now yeah yeah yeah, um, but I didn't give up and, uh, and things started to happen and it, it was really exciting. And mm -hmm. so I ended up building this entire like inventory of stuff. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I'll tell you, you know this. Okay. I don't know my own kiln. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to swear? I already said. Yeah. You, you yeah. Yep. yep. <clears throat> it's fine. Okay. Ceramics take fucking forever. Yes. Yes. First, you build them. Awesome. I would like to be done at that point. <laughs> no, no. No, now it dries for however many days. Then you bisque fire. Now mm -hmm. you have to glaze it. Now you have to fire it again. And mm -hmm. I do gold luster on mine. So now I have to do gold luster and I have to fire again. I, yeah. I am such a quick, like, that's why I love collage. It's like you yeah. cut out the thing, you glue it, you're done. Yes. <laughs> you know, and this is just like, are you fucking kidding me? It's like, yeah. weeks are passing. Yes. And I have a snake in a moth. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So I tried to see it as like a message from the universe, Danielle, mm -hmm. learn patience, slow <laughs> down, stop swearing. And I tried really, <laughs> but 
I don't know unless I can afford a kiln at some point so that I can just do it in my own time yeah. and have it like fire over it. like but being part of a community yeah um uh studio is awesome for lots of reasons but right. it's also really slow because you know you might want yourself in the kiln but there's a class of stuff right. that has to go through the kiln first right so right. you're actually waiting an extra yeah week. you're waiting on that schedule yeah yeah which fair enough like that's yeah. the point of a community studio right. however you're at a point it. where you want some speed <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so it's like top silly. gun <laughs> like i feel the yeah, need for like, speed <laughs> Lock 10 people, I gotta get this thing. <laughs> and so I think until I can afford a kiln, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I have so much work that and we're gonna get to it. I think that I showed in Miami at yeah. during um, our yeah. Miami week um, <clears throat> that I've kind of deconstructed and I think I'm gonna repurpose it. So I have hundreds of pieces. Yeah. So I can kind of stop making for a bit. I've got this really great inventory and um, I've combined it now with my other love found ceramics mm -hmm. from thrift shops mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I well, we were joking before we were recording that um I always say that thrift shops are kind of like my church yeah like if I if I'm ever feeling overwhelmed or if I you know whatever it's just like mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go and smell the mothballs and <laughs> there is a smell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a smell. I smell always and it smells like old ladies and I'm like that's how you know it's a good one yeah if it smells right. like that that's how you know you're gonna find good stuff um and so I was like I and I always, you know, buy weird knickknacks and they're all around my house. And then I was like, but if I love this mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. why am I not incorporating it into my artwork? Mm. So I started to do that a little bit. So, oh, so I got a Dremel. Yes. I was going to ask you, cause that's what the tool I was thinking of. Like she doesn't have a Dremel. She needs a Dremel. And it's the best. <laughs> that was a birthday gift from my husband one year early on in our dating. And I was like, this is the best. You have no idea. And then I got a whole <laughs> thing of accessories one year from him. And I was like, yes, you understand me. <laughs> <laughs> that is where I am now. I'm always like, well, <laughs> my husband this morning said are you gonna go to the studio tomorrow I'm like yeah I said I have a whole bunch of holes to put in shit and uh, and so I've been like breaking stuff and sanding it off and putting yep. holes through things and um and I again was scared to use yeah. the tool because first of all I didn't know what I needed right um there's a ceramicist uh named um Deborah Bros yeah you know her work? I know her name she I can't picture her work though yeah she makes these, she combines like old ceramics. So it'll be like a cat head with like a duck body and mm -hmm. but it's seamless. Yeah. Uh, Cause her job is actually ceramic restoration. Oh, sure. And so she's, she's a magician. And yeah. so her own work combines these things. Mm -hmm. And so I messaged her. That's nice. the nice thing about being the jealous curator is I know so many artists that are yep. so good and I can message them and go, yep. hello. <laughs> how do you put a hole in stuff without it breaking <laughs> she's like you're gonna need a dremel and I was like I don't know what a dremel is so I googled it and uh lo and behold Santa brought it on Christmas morning and <laughs> and it sat there for a couple of weeks because mm -hmm. I was scared yeah I, was like, I don't there's too many attachments like I do not yeah. like I don't power actually tools. like learning new things yeah yeah <laughs> and power tools like I just was like I yeah I, I don't like reading instruction manuals yeah but you need to, you do, you know? Yeah. Anyway. So I read the manual and now I, I feel like kind of badass, you know, yeah. I'm like, uh-huh. Time to put on my goggles and my little face mask and let's do this. Thing. That's right. It's very exciting. It is it's like the gateway drug, right? You're like, Oh, what other power tools should I get? <laughs> I was just thinking next, you need an angle grinder for your shelves that you'll have in your future kiln. And then you could like learn mm -hmm. how to weld and use a plasma torch. I feel like you would go nuts with that because it's like you can cut metal freehand as though you're drawing and it's so much fun. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh I just can picture you enjoying that in some way. I'm like, she could freeform cut all sorts of things with this. <laughs> I want to, I want to do that with wood. Is that a jigsaw? Yeah. What do you need to do that? Um, they do jigsaws. And then I think like with 3d printing stuff or things similar to that, I don't know enough about wood, but I do know there are ways that you can cut things through laser cutting in wood too. That allows you a lot okay. of free form cutting. Um, Anderson Ranch Art Center, a little shout out to them, but there are workshops there and they would be, you know, kind of Southeast of where you are. So it wouldn't be too bad yeah. They're in, in the Rockies. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they're on my, they're on my bucket list of, um, residencies. residencies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And they have winter residencies that are really, it's pretty there in the winter too. Mm -hmm. Well, my tiny baby boy. So when we met, my son was kid. Yeah. He is now 17 and a half and about to graduate from university and, or uh, high school and leave me for university. Yeah. So my plan is to sign up for as many residencies as I can so that I don't notice he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't just sit in my living room and cry and watch videos of him when he was two. Because right now that's the plan. Oh my God. A little bit of that too. I know those little videos of them, like it just brings back like such sweetness. And it also reminds you of how much they've grown. Like even we, my husband and I do that right now. And we're like, oh, they're so big. How old are yours now? They're, so my son is 13. My daughter is almost 12. And my other daughter is nine and a half. Yeah. Jeez. I know. Yeah. they. It's crazy. It I is. Know, Charlie's six foot five. Okay. And that so, is, this is a whole side thing, but when they get bigger than you, it is so weird or like the same size you as you. And you try to hug them yes. and these giant people. It's so hot. I'm like, oh, I just want to cuddle you. And then I, I can't, I just end up being really weird. <laughs> I know I do it anyway. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I just going to keep doing it. And like, when you're, when you're 30, you'll think it's awesome. I realize yeah. now you hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> So anyway, true, that's true. my plan yes. for when he leaves. Awesome. Is that I, I, I want to go and learn all these things, learn these power yeah. tools and also go to these, like, I always have the mom guilt of like leaving, you know, leaving mm. for being away for two weeks and yeah. whatever. And now like my husband will be fine without me. And yeah. I, you know, I just want to go and try these things. Yeah. And I think being in environments like that, where they have all the tools and they have right. the experts and they can help you exactly. figure, you know, and it's a place to explore and not worry if you don't know what you're doing. So and you're, point. yeah. And like at Anderson Ranch too, like ha I've taught there and then also been a student there and work there. So I've had all three experiences mm. at, the, at that place. Oh, I didn't realize. Yeah. It's really fun. I've loved having done those things, but what I love about the way they emphasize the workshop is that you're, you're going not to make anything finished. You're going to learn a process, a new, you're going to stretch yourself. And so their emphasis is on process. Mm. And I just think that that's such a healthy way to help everyone be free in their exploration. Cause it's like, you can go and not make the work you always make. And that's okay because this isn't for anything other than to do this time and like to gift yourself that experience and that mental mindset when you go. I love that they do that. It's so good. That is amazing. Cause I think again, like in the world we live, it's about speed. Yeah. It's also about productivity. Like you're supposed to like be, mm -hmm. there's supposed to be a result after every single thing you think or do. And yeah. it's like, it's so nice to be like, you don't have to come out of here with anything except, mm -hmm. you know, you know, learning something that you didn't know before you got here. Like, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So question, a couple questions for you. I want to go back one thing to the jealous curator identity. And I wanted to just kind of talk to you a little bit more about why you developed that identity. And you've talked about how you're working to merge your identity as your art with that. But I'm curious why you developed the identity in the beginning. Um, because I was a stay-at-home mom with a two-year-old in a suburb of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And it did not sound cool. Mm -hmm. It felt really like, who's going to who's going to believe that I have any expertise mm. in, or, or that I have good taste. Like if I'm like, hi, I'm this yeah. mom and a bird, you know, I, I really, and I worked in marketing and branding for yeah. years and years and years. That was my job and in ad, ad agencies. And so I kind of knew I, I wanted a persona to kind of hide behind. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, my photo is still, my face isn't even on it. It's a picture mm -hmm. with like a Polaroid over my face of the back of my head. Mm -hmm. So I kind of really wanted to hide like who I was day to day and, and kind of create this persona that, you know, I kind of wanted to pretend I lived in Brooklyn or LA and, yeah. you know, I was part of this art world. Um, if we want to get really deep, it was also that I kind of never really believed I belonged in that world. Like I was told mm -hmm. in art school that I didn't belong. I mean, mm -hmm. repeatedly. Yeah. And so I, maybe subconsciously I was like, well, I can't show up and say I belong because I don't. So I mm. kind of 
uh, and decided to create this sort of pen name, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. and for the first two and a half years, I didn't even in my about section, didn't even have a Danielle or Krista. I didn't yeah. know what my name was. I didn't nothing. And yeah. so many people thought um, for a long time, I mean, the picture was of a woman, but for the longest time, people thought I was a man in England. Mm. Uh, in London, because I <laughs> spelled the Canadian way, like I spelled. Oh, of course. And, <laughs> yes. yeah. and, uh, and so people just assumed or they thought I was in Brooklyn or LA or wherever. And I just yeah. never corrected anyone. Yeah. I just let them think what they thought. Yeah. And it Build wasn't their until story. I spoke at, yeah. And it wasn't until I spoke at the um, Alt Summit blogging conference, design blog conference in 2011, 2012, mm-hmm. that I had to like, and I was on a panel and nobody yeah. knew what I looked like or anything. And then, and so I got there and there were people that were like fans of the blog that were like looking around trying to figure out like, <laughs> where is, like, where is, where is the joust curator? What do they look yeah. like? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. So I tell a lot of people actually like, and, and the other part was that I'd worked in advertising for so yeah. long and I didn't want my advertising yeah. uh, people to know I was doing this. Yeah. I don't know why I just wanted the freedom of just being anonymous and so yeah. it was really nice and so I tell people you know if you're nervous to start a blog or or whatever or, or whatever it is an Instagram page um do it under a pen name nobody yeah. needs to know who you yeah. are and and it gives you the freedom to say whatever you want the way you yep. want for as long as you want until yep. you either shut it down or you're ready to say actually mm-hmm. here, here's who I am mm-hmm. um and, and I mean, it was really good for that. And I think though, in hindsight, it has done this weird thing um, where it's divided me into mm-hmm. two people. And another, honestly, another huge reason was that I wasn't making art. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I was, I thought it was terrible. Mm-hmm. And I was, but I know that my taste in art is really good. In mm-hmm. other people's art. Yep. So I, what I was afraid of was that people would Google Danielle Krissa and be like, uh, oh my God, like the jealous curator's taste is up here, but her artwork sucks. Yeah. And I was afraid that it would like damage the mm-hmm. brand, right? Which mm-hmm. is so terrible. Like, yeah. what a mean inner critic. Yeah. But then one night at two in the morning, I was Googling myself as mm-hmm. you do. Mm-hmm. And somebody figured it out. This girl with an art blog figured it out. And she wrote about it. And she said, it was like my nightmare come true. She said something like, Considering how um, fantastic the jealous curator's taste in contemporary art is, you wouldn't think her art would be so trite and this and that and amateurish and whatever. And I was like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like the thing I was worried about, the people would go, oh, don't worry, that's not going to happen. Happened. Happened. I like, I knew it, you know. Yeah. I'll write this down, take this to my therapist. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that just furthered the divide in my mind that it's like, yeah. okay, people can't know. People cannot know. I mean, mm. granted, that was way before I was actually like making yeah, daily again, you know, but it just solidified that in my mind that it was mm. just like, oh, so, yeah. you know, these things have stayed very separate. And the way I use it to my advantage sometimes is like when I was working on this stuff for Miami. Mm-hmm. I'd be working on things and I, I evaluate it as the jealous curator. So mm. I'll look at it and be like, would the jealous curator write about this? Mm. And if the answer is no, then I know I have to keep pushing myself or, you know, yeah. try different stuff. And if I look at it and go, oh, she would for sure write about this. Yeah. Then I'm like, okay, I'm in a good spot. Mm. So it's this weird, like out of body, like yeah. <laughs> split personality thing. Yeah. Um, so it does work to my advantage that way. Yeah. But I was telling my therapist about this, who knows nothing about art and the art world or whatever. And then he was like, but you realize it is all the same person, right? Right. Like, you get that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, also, rationally, yes. <laughs> yes. And also I would add to that, like, it's all the same person. And if it's all the same person, then all of you belongs. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm working on. Yeah. 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 It's a real. Yeah, it's it's so weird. It's such a um, tangle in my in my mind that I'm working really hard to untangle because yeah. I want that. You know, I 
I am making the work. Yep. I am showing up. I am doing all of that. But what I need to change is my belief that not that I'm worth, maybe that I'm worthy of success. Like that, you know, that like, mm. or I don't know that I'm allowed to do this and, and, mm. and have some success with it. And yeah. I think that's the hurdle that I'm trying to get over. And I was just saying to my husband, it's funny because with the jealous curator, I have all this confidence, right? But I grew up in a family that was very much about education, right? Like yep. my dad had a PhD, my sister went to law school, like er everybody, my mom went to university at a time when a lot of women didn't go to university. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's this thing yeah. where we have all done a ton of school. Yeah. Um, can't leave my brother out. He also went to school and then did extra school on top of that. And so I think why I have so much confidence as a jazz curator is I didn't go to school to be a curator. <laughs> yeah I didn't go to school to be a writer so I have nothing in my head I have no past trauma saying like this writing is not very good yeah all I have is Chronicle asked me to write a book about two or three years into Jealous Curator mm -hmm. I pitched it mm -hmm. they said yes mm -hmm. I didn't even get rejected my first time yeah <laughs> that book that book came out and Oprah's people called yeah you know so I've only had encouragement yeah. and stuff so so I don't have any like old seeds that were planted a long time ago. It's just like, to yeah. me, I'm like, oh, it, it's, I don't know. I can just do it and feel good about it. Where yeah. art, I have all these old, old seeds planted from back when I was like five years old. Mm -hmm. that right now I'm trying to weed out and like keep the flowers yeah. and get rid of the prickly stuff, you know? Yeah. And it's, yeah. It's so much work. It's like, oh man, there's another prickle. Like I, I thought I got it all. You, know? it's just like <laughs> you think it's all gone and then that weed pops up again. Yeah, like, oh, damn it. I thought I got you out. And you know, it's, so it's just that's where I am right now is trying to yeah. weed this super tangled garden that's been growing for 50 years and just trying to figure out um what I want and how I'm gonna get there. Yeah. I think it's also being a woman too, you know, like I and I'm, I always joke that, I, you know, I, I'm a mother, I'm mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. I'm an artist, and mm -hmm. I'm Canadian. Mm -hmm. So I basically just apologize for existing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, it's like, it's also getting to a point in the, the age that I am and this point of life that I'm in yeah. to be like, you know what, I'm going to take up some space. Yeah. Like, I'm going to say the things I want to say. I'm going to create the things that I want to create the way I want to create them, whether you told me I could or I couldn't. Yeah, And it's just sort of like, I feel like I'm kind of starting to break out of my little cocoon, you know, and be like, it's time. Yeah. But I've been in this cocoon for so long and it's so cozy and warm and safe. It's really like, ah, it's, I'm, I'm having a hard time, but I, I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting out. And there is, you know, going back to your conversation around um, education too. And like, there's like, I'll say things like I'm formally trained in ceramics because I am, but right. I also always explored other materials all along and I don't need formal training to be an artist. I mean, I don't, it's helpful because no. it gives you language and some like things to pull from, but you don't. But I, I always try to use that for, I always try to say I'm formally educated in this because it helps me just kind of separate it. Like I spent time doing this thing and I can do these other things. Like for some reason, that is what widens it for me in that way. And mm -hmm. like, as you were talking too, I was thinking about like your comment around productivity too. And then like having worked in marketing and the demands of marketing is productivity, right? You have a client, you've got to produce for something for them. And so like, I'm and curious. It's, fast. it's, it's so, so fast. fast, right? So like, I'm yeah. wondering about like how that is like, infiltrating into your thoughts around productivity in the art making. And it is like going back to the other thing you said too, ceramics is so painfully slow. I just bumped into a really <laughs> old friend at the museum on the weekend and he was like, oh my God, I've had to hand build. And I now think of you and how he goes just this morning, I was thinking of you and like, she used to do this a lot and it is slow and he is the potter. And like, I was like, it is, it's so painfully slow in, in sometimes. And then sometimes it's this gift of slowness too, right? Because it forces you to have to be slower with it and like change expectations, change. Yeah. But I'm just- That was the beauty that came out of it for me was like, yeah, 
I mean, at first I was super frustrated and then, and then it became almost meditative. And I, mm-hmm. I just had to embrace the fact that like, this is not going to happen immediately. And it's actually helped me in lots of other places in my life. Like I'm pitching a new book right now and, and you, you just want to keep hitting refresh on your email to see yes. if they've gotten back to you yet. Yes. And it's like, you know what? It's going to take time. It always, every single time it takes time. So why am I hitting refresh? Like, mm. and, and working in ceramics actually taught me that, mm. um, what did you say before that though? What, what did you say before? I was talking about the market, the productivity with marketing and how that's infiltrate, oh, like right. how that influences like your expectation of pace maybe in your practice. That's very, that's a good insight. Um, I never thought about that. Well, you know, what slowed me down because I'm, oh, I think that's why I, when I stopped painting and I started making art again, I went to collage because mm-hmm. it is super fast, right? Mm-hmm. Once you have everything cut out, like you can make 15 collages in a day and it's mm-hmm. like, ah, <laughs> yeah, they're done. Yeah, <laughs> they're on the yeah. wall. <laughs> and there, I do love that. Like there's yeah. something really satisfying that, that I really like about that. And, yeah. um, but, um, I started working with, um, a sculptor named Peter Coyne, yeah. um, a few years ago and, she is amazing. She, she, her sculptures are huge. They, they take a long time. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, um, you know, we we're talking about the new work that I wanted to be doing. And she goes, okay, you know, like, I want you to take some time to really like play and try different materials. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And she's like, yeah, like take a year or two. And I was like, a year or two. Like I was thinking maybe a week, <laughs> you know, and she's like, oh no, 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 no. No, like you need, you need to just be mm-hmm. in your studio, mm-hmm. try something and then take it apart and then try it another way and take it mm-hmm. apart. And I was like, oh my God, like I, yeah. this is going to kill me. Yeah. And, um, but I, I respect her so much and I love her so much. And I was like, okay. Yeah. And she said, can you give me five hours a day in the studio? Mm. And I was like, I actually can, like mm. I can get off of Instagram. <laughs> like I, I actually <laughs> could, yeah. you know? And so I did, I started giving myself five hours in the studio. And even if I didn't really have a plan for that day, I would, you know, just start puttering or I would do whatever. And it was, it it ended up being about a year and a half between starting with her and actually showing that work. Mm -hmm. And it changed so much in that time because, because I knew I was giving myself this year or two. Yeah. I wasn't getting precious with anything because it didn't need to be done at the end of the day, like in advertising or whatever. It was like, well, in a week, it's kind of, and I, I would go somewhere because I'd be right. in the studio every day. So it wasn't just sitting there doing nothing. Right. Um, but I, I'd come back down and she had a really great, um, a really great way of uh, evaluating your own work, which do you remember that movie LA Confidential? That, mm, I remember, I can see the movie poster because like I worked at a video no, shop. That's not, what but... it's called. that's not the right movie. Oh, that's a different movie. I think it's the one with um, Steve. Um, oh my God, what is wrong with my brain? Anyway, there's a scene in it. In this movie. What is the guy from? Yes. He's in the murders in the building now. Oh, Steve, Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Sarah yes. Jessica Parker. Anyways, we'll figure it out and then I can yeah, add something. it. Something, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Everyone else that's listening that will be like, oh my God, how can they not know this thing that they're trying <laughs> to know? <laughs> it's just completely gone from I need more coffee. I need to be more committed to my coffee. Um, <laughs> but there's a scene in it where the lady says, you, when you're about to walk out the door, you do a quick turn around into the mirror and the first accessory you see, you remove. Cause it's, oh, yeah, then it's yeah, one too, too many much. accessories. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so Peter kind of said the same thing about your oh. art. She's like, try and come into your studio with a clear mind. Yeah. And quickly look at the thing you were working on yesterday. And the first thing that sort of jumps out, yeah. remove it. Mm. because it's probably not needed or it's too much or it's drawing too much attention or whatever. So mm-hmm. I started, I started doing that because I had time and it yeah. was, and so really working with her, but I mean, it was like a 12 step program. Like she had yeah. to really work with me to like, yeah. to, you know, 18 years of being in, in ad, the ad world, um, you have to deprogram yourself from yes. that and slow yep. down a little bit. And, um, it, that was one of the best things about working with her was just learning how to slow it. And then, and then, you know, the universe presents ceramics to me, which is even slower. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, 
<laughs> I guess I'm still learning this lesson. Like what is happening? It gave you, it gave you um, a year warm up to get to that place before right. it gave it to you. It's like, you need, there was yeah. a reason why we only pinched one small pot together. And then yeah. there was like years in between where it was like, okay, just remember, yeah. but you're not ready yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that was really what slowed me down and made mm. me realize that there is value in and taking your time and going back to ideas and being yeah. like, oh, like in advertising, they always call it the first idea. Mm. The first idea is never the best one. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes mm -hmm. you come back to it and it turns out it's not so shabby, but very yeah. often when you're like, oh my God, I've got it. Yeah. You kind of don't. Um, and if you have the luxury of time, you can kind of push yourself past that first idea, mm -hmm. which is usually the most obvious, or it's usually the most stereotypical or mm -hmm. it's, it's the easiest one to get to. Mm -hmm. And if you can push yourself to be like, I like where this started, mm -hmm. but is there a more clever way to say it? Or is there a different material I could use? Or is there mm -hmm. a different, like, how could I do this to push mm -hmm. it a teeny bit further? Like PETA always pushed me a teeny bit further. Mm -hmm. Even when I thought I was there, she would give me another little shove. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of magic, you know, when, mm -hmm. when you realize like you can keep taking yourself somewhere new and yeah. um, challenge yourself and surprise yourself with mm -hmm. how far you can take an idea or a material or both. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I love how you described it as a tiny little shove because the shove is like not gentle at all, but she just no. gave me like a little. <laughs> oh, she's not gentle. No, she's, she's this tiny little thing. And she's just like a force to be reckoned with. Like mm -hmm. I just admire her so much. I mean, she mm -hmm. taught in New York um, at the school of visual arts for 25 years while she was also working. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, like teachers are the best, like yeah. artists who are also teachers because they have such a good way of explaining mm -hmm. and they have such a, they've seen such a breadth of students yeah. that they've kind of seen it all. So yeah. if you can ever like set up a, a mentoring relationship or like a, a mutual partnership where you're kind of mentoring each other with somebody who's been a teacher, oh my yeah. God, they are like a wealth of information. Yeah. yeah. Cause as a teacher, you have to learn. I was talked about it this way, like you have to learn to speak the language of each individual student you're working with, because if you if don't, you're a good teacher, yeah. yeah, if you don't, you're only going to give them your language and that's not what you want. You want to show them like, what is their language and what does that bloom into? And like, that's, that was the thing for me. It was like, who, who I want to learn your language so that we can make this mm. yours and bigger and more. And like that's so important. And so like thinking about mentors or people that you match with, like you want somebody who is coming to you through through your language, but knowing how to like right. push it and kind of, yeah, nurture it. And like when you were going back or going back to when you were talking about like your biggest fear of the blog was someone finding out it was you and that sort of thing. And then like their, you know, their critique, like it made me think like, I am just so over critical not criticalness, but criticalness that just comes off like often as mean rather than like critical that gives you growth and gives you something to yeah. do with it. Gives you a shove. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that's so, so important. And I just don't think that anyone really grows much from that kind of criticism. And so really, if we want the most vibrant world that we can be a part of like why are why are we wasting time doing that? Like why not just give critique that is about enhancing or helping that person to the next place. Like imagine if critics were writing like that, like what would it be like to read something like that? I just think I call it, I like to call it feedback instead of mm -hmm. critique because yeah. critique already sounds negative. Yeah. Like it already sounds like it's going to be like bad news Yeah, where I think feedback is so much more encouraging. It's like, mm -hmm. it can still be like, this isn't where it needs to be. And it right. just, you know, shoves you again, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but it's feedback. And so I have like what you were just saying about speaking the language of the student you were talking mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I had such a bad experience in my art school, but I had one professor, um, Elspeth Pratt, she's a mm -hmm. sculptor as well. Mm -hmm. um, she was my drawing teacher, uh, but <laughs> she was a sculptor herself. Yeah. And she, she, she was amazing. She must, and you mm -hmm. must be exhausted at the end of each day, but mm -hmm. she saw every kid that was in front of her. Yeah. 
And she saw me so clearly and called out a bunch of stuff pretty early on um, mm -hmm. that, you know, she was saying like what a designer she thought I was. Mm. Like, I think you instinctually know how compositions should work and you mm -hmm. understand color and you understand text, like just mm -hmm. without even being trained, you just yeah. know. Yeah. And I remember being a little bit upset by that in that sure. I thought she wanted me to quit being an artist. I was like, but I want to be an artist. And she said, no, 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 no. I, you can, but she's like, I honestly think after this, like for jobs and stuff, you should look into design because I think it would feel mm -hmm. effortless to you. Mm -hmm. And it did, mm -hmm. but that her saying that also coincided. And I mean, I so appreciate that she saw me and she was right, yeah. but that also coincided with the other prof saying I should never, mm -hmm. you know, I, I couldn't do it. I should never paint again. I should never be. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, that meant never be an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went off to design school and she was exactly right, I fit right in. I, mm -hmm. I was, you know, <laughs> did really well. I got a job right out of school. Yeah. It just reinforced the, oh, I should This be is artist. where I'd be. Yeah. This is where I'm supposed to be. But yeah. I always had this like longing to be an artist. But I, mm. uh, I, between this person who I really respected saying, I think you'd be a better designer <clears throat> and this terrible guy saying, you can't do this my brain mm -hmm. the little pathways in my brain have told me the story that it's like well you're, you're not going to be successful at this you need to do this mm. but there's no reason rationally there's i can tell myself there's no reason that i can't mm -hmm. do art that feels designish I yeah all of my work looks very well, designed well it's incorporating text with imagery and composition like it's those three things yeah. she told you you do like you do that it's right there yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all right there. And so what I need to do in therapy is rewire my brain to be like, but that's still art. Yes. It, and that counts. It, it is. Counts, it is. Know? And like your work in the design field and honing that in and understanding the ease that that comes with, like that becomes such a powerful engine to, I think, like thinking about your art making too. Like this is the powerful engine that's behind me. Every time I come to making my art, I know how to put these things together. I know how to look at composition. I know how to make words that are funny, but also truthful. And, and like that gets to fuel that space. And then that's how they like merge too. Right. Like, and then it's like, Oh, I wish you'd been my teacher. <laughs> I gotta pretend that we're in a class. Just now pretend. And you're, a pinch pot and you're telling me this, and I'm like, these are the seeds I'm gonna plant. These are, and like, I mean, there's such beautiful things around the way that fire can. And this is such a ceramics thing, but like, fire alchemizes, right? Fire transforms, and so like that engine and that fire of your design world is going to transform into your art. Like it, it's fluid. It's not rigid, and so that is what you're bringing to this work and that you're creating now is this like whole powerful background and powerful engine that's there with you. I just... Do I have to pay you for a therapy <laughs> session? Oh no. That was amazing. That makes me feel so much better. Cause again, that's been separated in my mind, you know, like yeah. my whole design career feels like another thing yeah. from another time, but yeah. it's not, it's part of this whole story. Yeah. Which it's seems everything, like a no-brainer. Right? It seems like a no-brainer, but it's like all these things we have to collect. This is how I think about it for my own self. And maybe it's like my own process too coming in, but like I need to collect all this understanding and then it moves into something else. And like, that's like just the mm -hmm. process. So I've got to do some things for a bit of time. So I learn about it. So I understand it. And then it's going to just keep moving into something, whatever the next thing is. And like, as mm -hmm. long as I allow it to flow in that way, none of it becomes a stopping thing for me. It's just becoming part of this long flow of things. I just had a picture pop into my head um, and I'm sure everybody listening to this is visual learners too. So I, I get these like visions that just yeah. like when people are talking of like almost like a big witch's pot. Yes. With all of the things thrown in, right? Yeah. Like the, yes. the art kid stuff, the design years, the jealous mm -hmm. curator, the mm -hmm. work now. And it's just like, why am I keeping them as separate ingredients when they should yeah. really all be in this one pot getting all melted together with the fire underneath, you know? And they like, make something totally and then that's new. that's me. That's you. Yeah. You're the thing that emerges that's new out of this. And it's yeah, because of all of those things that you are created. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, and it's so funny because I, well, 
funny slash hypocritical because I tell other people this, right? Like yes. That, that you, the work that you make only exists because you exist. Right? I just like saw you your quote like, about that recently. And I was like, go oh, Danielle. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. But then I can say that to other people. Mm. And then when I try, you know, it's, you can always give other people such better advice oh. than you give yourself. Right. Yes. 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 <laughs> you <laughs> yes. can't see the forest for the trees when it's your own brain, but yeah. Um, but it is so true. And it's like, it, these things can't exist unless you put yourself into it. And that was another thing I was told in art school was that my work was too personal. I know that makes me so angry when I hear people, there are people who are still being told that. And I'm just angry what? about that. Yes. Your work should deep into yourself because when we go deep into ourselves, everyone finds themselves there with you. Like we're all there. Yes. Yeah. 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 We're all, we're not that different. All of us, like, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's so, so many of our experiences are similar. Mm -hmm. And if you can be vulnerable enough to, to say, here are the things I want to tell you about, like that's, so brave. Yes. Um, one of the things I, I always have aha moments when I'm in Venice because yeah. Venice. <laughs> um, but so last time I was there was the summer of 22 and um, the course that I'm with, they always give you a little book, you know, so I, and I was writing notes and drinking very strong coffee and eating gelato. And <laughs> one of the things I think I might even have it right here. One of the things I wrote in all caps, like on a page was say the stuff. Yeah. Because again, that whole like, Canadian woman, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I think I've always danced around the things I want to say with my work, but I don't want to offend anybody. And I want to yeah. like, and all that does is make you super vanilla and like a pot of porridge that mm -hmm. everybody could eat and mm -hmm. think is okay. But like, there's nothing spectacular about mm -hmm. it. And there's so many things I want to talk about, like mm -hmm. misogyny and patriarchy. And mm -hmm. um, I was in an abusive relationship and I, mm -hmm. you know, found my way past that trauma. And it's like, I want to say those things and mm -hmm. not worry what people like it's going to talk to the people it needs to talk to and exactly. the people it doesn't resonate with or the people it bothers well then fuck them it wasn't for them it was for the other people right. and it was for me yeah and but again I have that seed planted from a long time ago that don't don't mm. be personal with your work it's like that's impossible. That, that makes no sense. <laughs> oh, it makes no sense. Also, I've been thinking in the last few years, I've read a lot of memoirs and realized I love reading memoir. A memoir is all about one person. It's all about their experience. Yeah. And like, you know, I was just thinking as you were describing too, I'm like, gosh, what is Danielle's work? If she thought of it as a memoir, like what would that, mm -hmm. like, what would that be? Because memoirs allow people to tell the stories about their lives that they want to tell. And of course they keep some things private too, but like, what is the memoir of your work? And like, you're doing parts of your memoir, I would say, but what else mm -hmm. is there? What else are you digging at? So like when we, so that's let's a fun exercise actually to think about that. To right. Think about, and even to, like for, for me, for you, for people listening to like, mm -hmm. make that list, like what would you include in your memoir? And then now you've got that list and it's like, okay, well, how do you, how do you take those things and put them into your work mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. you're honoring all of those parts of you and honoring all of your experiences, good, bad, and ugly, because mm -hmm. that's what goes into that pot, right? Yeah. 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 Mm. So with this in mind too, like I want to talk about your, that work you did for Miami, which you call, I wrote it down as magic spells for modern gals. That was like the overarching, that was the theme, title, right? Yeah. The title. Okay. So let's talk about that body of work and like what you were doing with it, what you wanted to have happen with it and like visually and story-wise and all of that. Like, let's talk about that body of work that you did. So you talked earlier about having made snakes and moths out of the clay and what those, I saw some of those parts in the, the pieces, but let's talk about that yeah. work. Tell me, tell us more about that. Tell so what I wanted to do, um, was basically all of these bits that I was making the moths and the, you know, the flames and the flowers and the mushrooms and everything. I was thinking of them as uh, I've gotten very witchy lately. Yeah. Um, again, from the last Biennale, which was sort of witch themed, it was all about Leonora Carrington and the surrealists and mm. the power of like um, these women who were really into alchemy and yeah. they were all feminists in a time when being a feminist was a very unpopular idea and they did not care. And mm -hmm. it was so inspiring. And the women I was there with have become really good friends. They were all just students in this course, but we all really resonated with it. Mm -hmm. And there was no men in our 
-hmm. in our class. Like usually mm -hmm. it's a, a mix. It was all women. Well, mm -hmm. and one 20 year old drag queen named Lee Fry, who was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, I don't count as a guy. You can put me in the girl camp. Love and it. Um, it was just witchy and wonderful. And so I started thinking about like the idea of, of conjuring spells. And, and mm. I was like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could, if, if we could make modern day spells to like get rid of misogynistic bullshit and to get rid of the patriarchy. And mm -hmm. so I started making these ingredients that were sort of like old school witchy, you know, mm -hmm. ingredients like, a, you know, eye of newt and whatnot. Um, <laughs> but to get rid of modern day problems. Yeah. And so, um, and I love writing because I, you know, yeah. I, I, I've written lots of books and I, I was keeping that very separate too. And then I was like thinking mm -hmm. at one point, well, I love writing. Why isn't it part of my work? Yeah. And so um, the titles, each title is a spell basically like a little mm -hmm. rhyming spell. Um, so like there's one that's um, something like um, um, quartz and flora and and moths all mix be gone forever unwanted dick pics <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's one about mansplaining and one about gaslighting and um mm -hmm. something like you know um i can't remember how the beginning of it goes but like unless she says yes keep your dick in your pants mm. and just stuff like that so it's just yeah like, you know no means no Mm -hmm. you know get the fuck off of me and stop oh there was one because it was in Miami right I did one that was um something to to ward off being grabbed by the pussy oh yeah because we were like down the road from my yes. logo so I was so curious how that would go over in mm -hmm. Florida well I, I guess everyone that attends the art shows are pretty liberal so people generally it was hilarious <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> generally I would say yeah nobody nobody smashed my booth or anything but um so that's what it was all about. And mm -hmm. um, they were the, the all of the ceramics were free floating. So I, I put holes in the back of all of them. So they yeah. were, and but then they were hung in clusters to make the one spell. Yeah. And then I, I engraved little brass plates with mm -hmm. the, with the spell. And then it was hammered into the wall within the, within the composition. Um, which I really loved because, and I painted my wall light pink. Mm -hmm. And so people would come and they'd be like, oh, and I, I was sitting right there, but nobody yeah. realized I was the artist. Yeah. And they were like, oh, it's so pretty. And, and, uh, and you <laughs> see somebody go, like a woman go up and read the, read the thing and just burst out laughing and then like <laughs> call all of her friends over. And then if they, you know, they sort of like glanced at all of it. And then they, they looked at like, they finally read like spell number eight of 12. They would go back to the beginning and oh. read all of them. Yep. And so it was really wonderful. Like, and then I had people like, oh my God, are you the artist? And we'd have these amazing talks. And then they would tell me stories of like mm -hmm. some funny ones, some terrible, mm -hmm. like there's, there was one about date rape and like, you know, mm -hmm. so it was my way of, of, of bringing these, like saying the stuff, Yep. but in a way that was funny. Yep. With kind of, it's like the junk bug you were talking about before yep. we started recording. It's like this, this like camouflage of like, it's mm -hmm. funny, so you can read it without getting offended. Mm -hmm. um, it was my like my sneaky way of like saying the stuff yeah. um, and getting people to read it and not yeah. feel defensive or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it worked. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I loved it, but there was a lot of stress around the installation. Um, yeah. I was terrified that the things were going to fall off the wall. Yeah. And they did. One yeah. one piece fell off the wall and shattered. Mm. um problem was my wall was on the back was was the front facing part of the storage oh yeah that's no so good for anyone the yeah the door yeah no 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 shop. oh come on so it was stuff like that that I was yeah like, you, like I got this amazing opportunity and it was just stuff like that where I was like are you kidding yeah. like why would you put the ceramicist I'm the one ceramicist in the whole show and I'm on the back of this closet where every time and it was lovely worker dudes, but they don't care. Like they, they're they, well, they're, they're, they're not attentive, right? Yeah, no, they're going no, there for a need, awesome. not for a, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so they would just like slam the door and I was just sitting there and you could see it all shimmy. And I was just oh. like, oh my God. <laughs> so that super stressed me out. Yeah. And honestly, I had originally like, the, the original ones that I'd done that, they, that the galleries that brought me there saw were on panel and mm. I, they were all held in place with resin on panel. Sure. So they're indestructible. 
Yeah. You know? And, and she was like, I don't think, I think you should push yourself to like have them right on the wall. And I was like terrified, but I was like, well, maybe I'm terrified because I'm being pushed. It's like a yeah. pita shove, you know? Yeah. But in hindsight, I wished I'd stuck to my guns and said, no, Yeah. that is not what my work. I don't want my work to look like that. I want my yeah. work to look like this. Yeah. Um, but because I'm in this learning phase, yeah, I was I I listened, and even though my gut was saying, I thought maybe it wasn't my gut. I thought maybe it was fear. Yeah, right. It's hard and to know which one. Yeah, it's hard mm -hmm. to know. And in hindsight, it was like, nope, it was my gut. Yeah. Um, so thankfully, I got it. Um, and I didn't sell one thing, mm -hmm. um, which was mm -hmm. a little bit upsetting, but yeah. I also heard that like sales were way down for the entire art week. So I was like, okay, um, what the wonderful thing came out of it was those conversations mainly, mm -hmm. with women, but I did have one man, he was probably in his late sixties and he was just on his own and he came up and he was like a little bit teary. Oh. Uh, he's like, oh, I don't, I don't usually cry, but I get goosebumps if I'm going to like, instead of mm. crying and he was all goosebumpy. Mm. And he said, I'm the single dad of four girls mm. that were like age 36 down to 26 or something. Mm. And, uh, he said it, and he had read every spell mm. and he said, you know, it breaks my heart that my girls have had to put up with this shit their entire lives. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I've tried my best to guide them and support them and whatever, but he's like, I'm a white man. Like, what do I really know mm -hmm. of, of how this stuff feels? And he said, it just breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I've taken a picture of every single spell, like of, of the words. And he's like, I'm going to go right home and email these to my girls. Mm -hmm. And that right there felt like there, that's there. where I came. Yep. Yep. You know, like, and yeah. I didn't really care about the, like sales. Sure. Money is nice, you know, but right. ultimately when I think about what I, I wrote a list the other day, post-therapy about, cause I said, I want success as an artist. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? And what I is think the, everyone yeah. should do this. Yeah. What does that mean? Be, because it, it's different to everybody. Like somebody yes. might mean success means selling a piece for $10,000. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I love I would love ten thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But when yeah. I actually wrote my list, yeah, it, sales was the last thing on my list, mm. which I thought was super interesting. Yeah, um, it is. Um, and the other things were um, make work. The first thing on the list was make work that I'm proud of in private and in public. Mm. Mm -hmm. because I will be so proud of myself in my studio. Like mm -hmm. in my studio, I'm like, I'm a fucking genius. Like mm -hmm. this is good. The second it goes out into the world, I become that kid at art school again, who's yeah. just bracing myself for yeah. the worst critique of my life, you know? Yeah. So I want to, and the thing is, I don't need to change the work. The work's already good. Mm -hmm. I need to change my mindset to, yes. regardless of what people think, regardless of what, to, to keep that pride Mm -hmm. once it's in the world, you know, yeah. and that that's on me. That has nothing to do with anyone's reaction to it, to any critique, right. to anything that that's my brain. Yep. Um, and so the list, there was like eight things and it kind of went down. And one of the ones sort of near the top as well was have the work resonate with people, like have them understand what it is I'm trying to say and have it make them laugh or move them to tears or, mm -hmm. or bring up a childhood memory or whatever it is I want to happen. That to me is more successful than selling something for $10,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know and what that, I mean? So it's like, absolutely. Well, I'm already doing it. I, you I did it. Yes. I did yeah. it. You know? Yeah. So it's realizing that. And I think when you actually write that list, instead of being like, Oh, I want to be a successful artist. It's like, okay, well stop for a second. Yeah. What does that actually mean to you? And then yeah. when you look at that list, you're like, oh my gosh, I've already done three of those eight things. Yes. Okay. Well now how yes. do I, how do I work on those other ones that haven't come to fruition yet, but they're so close. They're so close. And, and yeah. I think also what you're speaking to sometimes too, around sales, if you're willing to talk about this for a little bit, because I think a lot of younger artists really struggle with this initially. And then it kind of, it can repeat as you know, throughout your life. But like when you have the sale where nothing sells, like it happens to every single yeah. person that's putting their work out there, there will be a time when things don't sell. And knowing like one thing that I remember was when I was working at the art center, a, a student, she talked to me and she just said, she was talking to me about prices. And she was like, your prices are like, 
not right. They're too low. She's like, you don't. And she's like, you're used to a price point because of where you're from. Cause she knew I was from the Midwest in this Minnesota, Wisconsin area, which has a very low price point for art in general. And she told me that. And she was like, you're just not in the right um, audience for your work yet. And so it was so helpful to have someone tell me that at that stage, like in my early twenties. And so when I think about even now, when things happen where I'm like, Ooh, I thought this was going to go better. I often think like, well, am I in the right place? Like maybe I'm in the wrong place with the work or, but in the case of what you just described, like, I think you were in the right place. You had people connect with the work in the way you wanted them to connect. Sales didn't happen yet, but I feel like people are going to be like, oh, remember those funny spells? And like, what happens if you do trust your gut again and you put them together on panels and pop them up for a sale and boom, they're gone because they're a panel and somebody knows what to do with that in their home. Like that's, I think that's right? what it was. I overheard several people say, but how do I hang this at home? And I yeah. I'd actually made like paper templates so that people could just tape it up yeah. and the camera, the nails. Totally. Go. But I overheard that repeatedly and I was like, Dum. so <sighs> you'll be happy to know my studio is filled with panels and that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm taking all the spells apart and reworking them in a way that makes me feel better and good. I just yeah. want some triangle panels. Which is oh, totally like witchy. Ouija board, like Ouija board yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And so I'm really, really happy. So I do think they're going to turn into something yeah. better. And I, I think, you know, I think sales will come. Um, but when you were just saying that about the getting it priced right, I was, I was talking to my friend, Martha Rich, who yeah. I just love so much. Yes. And she is successful, but she had said, so she's in Philly. Yeah. She said she'd never shown in Philly. Yeah. Um, and she said that she, she, she's shown all over the place. And she's like, my work only sells in certain places to certain people. Cause it's weird and kitschy <laughs> yes. and fun and whatever. I have one and of her eyes. Said, yeah, <laughs> I know. Me too. I have a mouth and a speech bubble. Uh, so she, she said there's two galleries, one in like a town in Texas, um, the web gallery and, uh, and then Hey there in Joshua, Joshua tree. tree. That's where I got mine from. Yeah. 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 And every time she has a show there, the collectors love her. Mm -hmm. The price point is right. And so she's mm -hmm. like, you just haven't found your people yet. You haven't mm -hmm. found mm -hmm. the city or the collector base or mm -hmm. whatever. And so she's like, all you can do is just keep going until you find that those yeah. people because she's like they're out there yeah but she's like maybe showing in new york is not the right place or maybe showing in wherever is not the right place mm -hmm. like you just have to find so i have a solo show coming up in santa fe and May, and i feel like witchy triangular stuff in santa fe is gonna sell like hot cakes <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> drop those people right from roswell yeah like get the people from roswell coming up too yeah. so <laughs> you know and maybe it won't be the right place but like that's the other thing you kind of have to put yourself out there and say you know if you had yeah. a show in in portland and it didn't go well well then maybe like san diego is your yes. place like who knows right yeah and you so don't know unless you keep on trying that and it, it's hard on your, your ego yes um it's hard on the checkbook it's expensive uh, so yes you, yeah <laughs> yeah so you just have to kind of keep going and i mean it's it's hard but you just have to rally and mm -hmm. like one thing peter said to me was you know, I, I kept talking about money because I'm like, oh, these supplies, they all cost so much money. And I, yes. and she's like, okay, well, what, what do you want? Mm. And I said, well, I want to be in MoMA one day. And she goes, okay. She's like, well, on a piece of paper, I want you to write money. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to write MoMA. Mm -hmm. Now cross out money <laughs> and focus <laughs> on MoMA. Because she's mm. like, the thing is, money doesn't matter. And I was like, well, and she's like, no, but think about it. She's like, if you you don't have to like go broke or whatever but she's like go out for dinner less mm -hmm. or you know shop at a superstore instead of like mm -hmm. a, a nicer market or do whatever she's like you can you can figure out ways mm -hmm. to put more money towards your art without getting a giant loan without going broke without mm -hmm. whatever she's like you can adjust your life mm -hmm. so that you can put more time and money into your work so that you can attain your goals she's like mm -hmm. that's what I'm telling you to do I'm mm -hmm. not telling you to like you know yeah forgo your your mortgage payments like yeah figure out a way to rejig a few things she's like if you don't have you know two lattes in a week there's ten dollars you could buy ten dollars worth of clay yep you know yeah um yeah I, focus I what she's telling you too yeah. yeah focus like yeah focus, which thing is your actual goal? And I know, and it's so easy to blame money. It's so easy to be like, well, I can't afford it. And it's like, 
but you can, you just have yes. to rejig a few things. Yes. There was Liz Wendlin, you know her too, obviously from River Falls, of course. She and I just got yes. together a couple of Fridays ago and we did this exercise where we talked about projects we're working on and took notes for each other and then asked questions back of like, what about this in the work or whatever? But one thing we talked about was money too. And like how, because she's in academia still, I'm not. And like, how do you fund your projects when you don't have access to grants in the same way or even just steady income in the same way? Well, so I just saw this artist the other day that like, all of his materials are found. Like he yeah. said he was walking down the street in New York and, and some worker guys were pulling old um, uh, posters off of like a hoarding thing at a mm -hmm. construction site. And they were just going to throw it away. And he's like, can I have that? And they were like, sure. And he did this amazing sculpture out of this stuff. So it's like, yeah. get create. we're creative people. Get mm -hmm. creative. You don't have to, like, it doesn't have to be the most expensive stuff. Or go through your studio and see what's actually in there already and try mm -hmm. and repurpose it in another mm -hmm. way. It's like something you could have <laughs> yeah. a whole other body of work of yeah. the stuff that you already have. You know? It's so true. It's so true. Yeah, or cut up old work. I, you know, I always tell, that's always a good jumpstarter project too, is like, all of us have piles and piles of old work and yeah. it's like you know what you need to save and what you don't need to save. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff you really don't need to save. It's like, okay, awesome. Slice yeah. it up, cut it up, turn it into something new. And suddenly you yep. have an entirely new series for free yeah. because you know, so money is just a really good excuse that we can yeah. hide behind, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're describing like looking in your studio for supplies too, like there was a a stretch which I feel like I've come out of where I was like saving everything. I'm like, well, this is my really nice paper. This is my really nice, yeah. whatever. And then I wouldn't yeah. use it because it was really nice and I need yeah. to save that. And then I was yeah. like, this is so dumb. Like get using it. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like you've had this for five years. It's time. Yeah. Like get using we this. all have that. You're right. I know people are listening and laughing because they're like, oh yeah, I've got that pile of saber. And then <laughs> we all have it. And yeah, yeah, we're saving it for when we're geniuses or something. Right. <laughs> like, oh, you know, now I'll have all the great yeah. things and yeah. I can do it then. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, you know, if you get a little resource party for yourself, a little resource party of one. Yes. And yes. you dug through all your stuff and put it in a pile in one place in the middle of your studio. I'm going to go do that right after this. I can't even imagine how much amazing stuff I'm going to have. So many good things and so many things you probably yeah. forgot you even had. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah I've got some of that. Like, let me get that yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Okay. I am looking at our time and I was like, holy crap, we have talked. It's so, I'm like. <laughs> There, we've gotten through maybe a quarter of like the things I'm like, oh, and I want to talk to her about this, and I want to talk to her. <laughs> we might have to do a part two. We might have yeah. to because you, there's a lot of good things to talk about with you. Um, one thing I do want to talk about because part of the like reason I started this particular podcast in these conversations is around like what happens when. Um, you kind of get stuck or when your creativity feels low or other things in your life impact your creative practice or your creative energy level and things. And like a couple things that I wanted to talk with you about, because um, one you've made work about and one you've talked about publicly too, but um, like when you were going through your health things with like the tumors and you made the tumors as fruit ob objects and talking about like the way that your time with health shifting impacted your work perhaps like through content, but also energy. And then also the passing of your dad, because that was so unexpected when that happened. And like whenever, and this comes from a place of kind of like genuine um, experience too, from my own self, like unexpected acute loss and the way that that disrupts your life and other people experience it through health as well, like disruptions because their health doesn't allow them to do what they normally would be doing. And I'm curious if you can just share a bit about either of those times, both of those times, and maybe what what came through in your life and your work and the way that it impacted or or didn't impact the your creative practice too. Mm -hmm. Well, both of those things um, stopped me in my tracks. Mm. Um, both of those things just sort of made me... Um, just want to lie on the couch and do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember thinking, 
again, both situations. So the the one the the main health one. I mean, I've had I have had issues forever. Um, but a few years ago, I actually they finally were like, we need to just take your uterus out. Like this mm -hmm. is just terrible. Um, uh, there was it was. I looked like I was six months pregnant. Mm. <laughs> I was not. Yeah. And it was really painful. And they're like, we just need to get this out of your body. And I was like, yes, mm -hmm. please do that. Mm -hmm. But then they did it and they threw it away. Mm. And I I was like, but it was just so weird to me that the, the place where my baby grew mm -hmm. and this thing that supposedly, you know, that makes you a woman, this, you know, mm -hmm. was just got thrown in medical waste mm -hmm. and I was really and and they did a little surprise um as I went into surgery they're like oh we're gonna have to make this incision double the size we thought so the incision was hip bone to hip bone mm. it was like about 12 about 10 10 11 inches across mm. so the recovery was really hard yeah and so I was depressed it was the very beginning of COVID so mm -hmm. I couldn't nobody could come to the hospital so I was there by myself so um, it was kind of, and this was about two years after my dad had died. And it was really similar, actually, how I felt in both mm -hmm. situations, just sort of blindsided mm -hmm. and achy and not, not motivated. Mm -hmm. um, and in both situations, I remember thinking, okay, I could just lie here forever. Mm -hmm. But the, the magic of being an artist, mm -hmm. our superpower Normal people just have to lie on the couch. Mm -hmm. Our superpower is that we get to turn it into art. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of harness all of the things you're feeling and figure out how to visually replicate those feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what got me up and moving. And so mm -hmm. for the uterus thing, um, I mean, because I've had fibroids and cysts and everything since I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, I always sort of pictured my abdomen area like this junkyard, like this old ashtray just full of crap. And mm -hmm. um, the only beautiful thing that came out of it was my son. And I cannot even believe I was able to get pregnant the mm -hmm. one time. Like, so that mm -hmm. was kind of a miracle. Um, but then when they told me they were taking this thing out and the, the afterwards, I mean, the doctor had no bedside manner and he basically mm -hmm. told me how disgusting it was. And he's like, oh, and he goes, and we're going to have to do a bunch of biopsy stuff because he's like, there's some pretty questionable lumps in there. And so I didn't, they were testing for cancer. Like it was just, and then, you know what he said? This is talk about misogyny. He says to me, and I'm, I'm by myself, I'm waking up from all the drugs and he goes, uh, oh, and uh, by the way, while I was down there, he goes, uh, I gave you a tummy tuck. He goes, those usually cost a couple thousand dollars. So he goes, uh, maybe a nice bottle of wine next time I see you. Disgusting. Oh Disgusting. my God. I just want to report and him. I realized in the moment, I probably could have sued for malpractice. Yes. Because he, you did, he, he also, did a procedure he didn't ask you to do. And he you messed didn't ask it up. To. Like he didn't do a good tummy tuck. So now I've got this like scar, blah, blah. And it's just like, I didn't ask you for that, you piece of shit. Like, yeah. Anyway side story so anyway I had all of that mixed in with it right mm. so I thought ah like I was just so upset by all of it so then I and every time I thought about these fibroids like they are gross fibroids are gross mm. and that's all I could picture in my body was this these lumps and these gross things and I thought okay my superpower as an artist is I can reimagine those things any way I want mm -hmm. so I started I made these um the show was called self-preservation um mm. because mm. I was preserving bits of myself but I was also preserving my mental health yeah and I found all these jars at thrift shops all different sizes and I basically made like specimens like like mm -hmm. natural history specimens mm -hmm. um in these jars but I made them out of broken vintage jewelry and mm -hmm. sparkly things and glitter mm -hmm. and broken glass and broken ceramics because I thought, you know what, broken is actually really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I can envision these lumps inside of me as crystal if I want. I don't yeah. have to envision what they're actually made of. I can envision them as like these mm -hmm. beautiful but broken things. And mm -hmm. there can be, you know, treasure found amongst the trash. Mm -hmm. And so that was how I kind of, and my God, it really did save me. Like yeah. that was what I was working on with PETA. And that's what I spent a year and a half working on. And mm -hmm. they started out on panels and then they were, bird cages on the floor mm -hmm. and then and then they ended up being in these jars mm -hmm. and that that's where they belonged right mm -hmm. and I poured resin in to hold everything together but it also it looks like formaldehyde yeah so it looks like these things are in formaldehyde and it really was such a preservation and then same thing with my dad a few years earlier it was like 
I need to process this. And as mm -hmm. an artist, the only way I can process things, I mean, I could lie on my couch and think and think and think and think, and I would never get to a place of healing yeah. without making art because it's just who I am. And so I did all these um, mixed media pieces that use sort of little artifacts. Like my dad loved his cowboy boots. So there's mm -hmm. one where there's like tiny little <laughs> cowboy boots in the middle and then this sort of mandala of found images and different colored paints. And it just, mm -hmm. it was a way, it was very meditative work because it was yeah. so many tiny marks. And the only thing I could do, you know, each piece would take about 50 hours. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could do was think about my dad. Yeah. And it was such a calming, healing, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes I would cry and sometimes I would have laugh about memories or whatever, mm -hmm. but it was sort of like this way of just being with him and thinking it through while making. And yeah. so now I, I tell people that a lot, you know, when grief comes up that like, that is a blessing of being an artist. We have this superpower of turning tragedy or turning trauma or turning something bad into something good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. did it with the jealous curator. That's why, you know, when I started jealous curator, I was jealous of everything. And mm -hmm. my husband said, you know, if you could say, if you keep jealousy inside, it becomes poison. But if you yeah. can say it out loud in a positive way, you can turn it into admiration and it worked. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, why can't I do that with grief? Yeah. And you or can. Why can't I do that with health or why can't I do mm -hmm. that with trauma? Like, mm -hmm. and we can, and lots of artists do it when you actually read their statement or you read the mm -hmm. stuff on the wall, even if it doesn't look like that's what it's about. It's probably what it's about. <laughs> the scenes. Yeah. It's yeah. probably what it's about. And, um, I think it's a really wonderful tool that we all, that we're gifted with by being creative people that we, mm -hmm. we can use that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just struck by it, what you were just describing too, and the connection then to that newer body of work and the magic spells. And you're just doing it too in another direct, in a direct overt way of like, I'm actually going to make spells for very specific things. And I'm going to yeah. help other people alchemize this too, because I'm doing it here for me. And now I'm going to do it here for others too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the work is going. And, mm -hmm. and I'm in a weird moment where I'm like, oh, I thought that is exactly where the work was going. And now I'm kind of realizing as I restructure things and take this time, Peter mm -hmm. would be so proud of me, <laughs> take this time to be like, okay, what is next? And how do I want to say this thing? And how do I want to evolve this idea even more mm -hmm. to speak to more people or to, you know, to take the learnings of chatting with those people in Miami and the stories mm -hmm. that they told me. It's like, okay, well, how can I take that information that they've given me and like elevate this even more for mm -hmm. me and for the viewers and whatever. So that's kind of where I am mm. right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's making me think there's a documentarian named uh, Matthew Heineman. And he was, I was listening to him in an interview and he was talking about a mentor of his in documentary style filmmaking said, if you go into a project, um, and you come out of the project making the thing you thought you would in the first place, you're not listening. And thinking oh my God, of, I love that. Right. And like thinking about you and your creative practice and anyone in their creative practice. Like if you go into anything that you're making and you come out making the thing you thought you would in the beginning, like you might not have been listening to yourself along the way to allow yeah, it. And to you're going become, too fast and you're yeah. going too fast. You're yeah. just executing. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Well, I'm going to, there's so much more to talk about. And I'm just like, have so many feelings inside my body are activated by talking with you today. <laughs> Don't edit any of that. I loved every single thing that we talked to. Me too. <laughs> I feel so good. I'm like, I just, I'm like, I got to make more coffee and go to the studio now. I, know, I, know. I just want to make work. Oh my gosh, amen to that. Oh, yeah. I know, right? Oh, God. But I do have, okay, so I have those final questions uh, for studio time wrap up. So we'll we'll end with those and then we can okay. do a quick talking out. And then we'll do a part two. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. we'll do a part two because I'm going to have to highlight like three quarters of my page. <laughs> still gotta come back I know to I also tend to answer in very long answers <laughs> that's exactly what I knows. oh but that's exactly what I want like that's the whole point of taking <laughs> this time and having a longer format is like I love expansive talks like this is like talking with friends and like that's you get to so much more um depth when you have a chance to just listen and just yeah like that's
Yeah, it's exactly what I, it's exactly what I intend. It's not what I want. It's what I intend for these conversations. (laughs) Yeah. That's my intention every time coming in. Yeah. It's not like it has to be this, but my intention is that it's a space of conversation and that it flows. Yeah. Okay. So this part though. Okay. So these are some prompts, questions. You can answer them as briefly or as expansively as you want. That is (laughs) okay. My intent is to not go on and on. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So the first one is finish the sentence. When I don't know what to create or make, I go to the thrift shop, go to church, go to church. (laughs) I love it in there. There's so many weird ideas. Even if you buy nothing. Yeah. There's just so much weird stuff and weird people and, and things that'll be like, Oh, a pear candle. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that gives me an idea. You know, you don't need to buy the pear candle, but you can just be like, oh, you know, it's, yes. just, it's just like this like weird scrapbook that you get to walk around in. I, I just yeah. love it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me want to go. Um, See? And, yeah, no, and it is, it's so fun. There's always something strange and there's always something that's like, hmm, wonder about that. And like, I'll buy old packets of like photos and letters. And then I start reading the things. Cause I'm just like, Oh, and then I'm like, there's nobody that wanted this in their family. <laughs> I, just, I know. I know. That's like, so, I know. And like, that's so rich, right? There's a yes. whole series right there. Yep. Yeah. I know. They just hang out. Although anyways. Okay. So the next one is, okay. I ask you to share five songs that you could listen to on repeat in the studio. Anytime. So embarrassing. <laughs> I know. Okay, so ahead, gonna, okay. All right. But first though, we are going to say that you said in the studio, you listen to true crime TV shows like Dateline 2020, 48 hours, any crime docs, yes. those kinds of things. You're yes. like, that's me. I just, and they're in the background. I don't even watch because they narrate it. So they're, they're, it's like listening to a podcast. They just, they're telling you what's happening. Yeah. And if I wasn't an artist, I would be a detective <laughs> because I could solve all of those crimes. All of them. You know how? Husband did it done <laughs> next episode <laughs> it's always the husband next okay so that's what I listen to that's what you listen to you did share some yeah. songs that you like when you run to which I do want to share because some people do need a good run list like you know there's a certain yeah. I was just talking about this this week with my husband like there's two artists that I listen to because he's like oh remember when you always listen to this and it was like Makaba by Jane and I'm like Yes, but she's a really good beat for running too. And like, I don't run often, but like when you find one that hits the right stride to you, it's like, okay, that's the one. Yeah. That's my pace. Yep. Yeah. So exactly. yours. <laughs> and, it, and it gets you like jazzed yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. They're, embar- they're embarrassing, but also, they're the truth. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. The first one, She's a Bitch by Missy Elliott. Welcome to New York by Taylor Swift. Boys by Lizzo. Boss Bitch by Doja Cat. And Dog Days Are Over by Florence and the Machine. I can say I know every one of these songs too. It's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I know not, I'm so not musical. And like my husband and my son, like they all just talk, I just leave the kitchen because they're like, oh, so-and-so's releasing this. And like, you know who produced that? I'm like, I, I just need to go. I need, I've got a dateline to solve. I got to put Bosch, I gotta boss out bitch on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it, isn't it funny when you ask me to do that and I listed them out, like I just went and looked at my playlist and picked like the top five. I was like, yeah. they're all kind of about women being awesome. Yes. That's what I noticed too. I was like, these are empowerment songs. Like that's what they totally are. <laughs> and whenever I listen to the Taylor Swift one, yes, I imagine it's like me arriving in New York for like some big event where like I'm the star attraction you know mm-hmm. and um I'm wearing something amazing and yeah. it's like nighttime and I'm crossing the bridge you know into Manhattan yep and Taylor's saying welcome <laughs> she's like Danielle welcome it's about time you got welcome here. to New York <laughs> yeah. and so I like that manifesting something I don't I know. love it That's I it. love the specificity yeah. because there's so much in like having specific visions for yourself or for things. I, that's something I'm working on. I realize like I'm great at writing really big, broad goals, but specificity is something I need to work more on. So like you're describing this scene. It's like, yeah, I see you there. I see you in that situation. Yeah. And then and that one day when it's and... actually happening, I'll be like, nailed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Tay Tay. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, just like Travis Kelsey when it's happening, it would just be even better. <laughs> I'll tell my husband. Okay. Uh, Greg's pretty great. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll, he's good. He can come too. He's got a beard. Well. He can come along. Yeah, he can come along. Yeah. But so anyways, if you want to talk any more about like how these specific things kind of like in the sense of having the Dateline true crime, all that, like how do they contribute to create a flow? You talk if you want to add to that or anything like that. It's how you describe, you know, they're on in the background. You can hear it. Describe it's descriptive. Yeah, I think it's just like a I think I, I listen to that stuff when I'm when I'm in execution mode. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. for the for the self preservation show, I made about three thousand clay cigarettes. Wow! Yeah, those are um, awesome. Yeah, I love them, and they're going to keep reemerging in the work because um, they're sort of the trash that gets mixed in with the beauty. Mm-hmm. I always put lipstick. Yeah. Well, paint, but like lipstick stain on them to make them feminine. But take, making three thousand clay cigarettes takes a really long time. Yes. And so that's often when I have that stuff in the background when I'm just like doing something that's like. Roll, 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 squish, yeah. squish, 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 <laughs> roll, 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 squish, squish. So it's just, it's just sort of meditative. So I yeah. don't really need to be thinking. Sometimes when I'm trying to think through, I mean, and I often tune out the show. It's like I'm yeah. not even. I have to sometimes go back to figure out who who did what to who because yeah. I'm my brain just wanders and I just yeah. you know I start thinking about the work or I start thinking about whatever and it's just sort of like lets me lull into a place where. I don't mm-hmm. actually have to pay attention, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, music. I find sometimes if I actually do listen to music in the studio, it's usually classical because mm-hmm. I just like to have the sounds yeah. without having to pay attention to lyrics. Yeah. Yep. Um, but then when I run, I really need that, like, you got this. Cause I'm really don't want to run up the hill. You know? so I <laughs> yeah. need, like I need Missy Elliott to tell me that I'm a bad bitch and I can do it. Um, oh my god it was so funny when I was in labor many many years ago I made two playlists mm-hmm. one was like all like hip-hop and rap and like my running music to get yeah. me all psyched because yeah. I'd never had a baby and I did not understand how any of this worked and then the other playlist was like all really like mellow quiet songs and whatever so apparently I don't remember this but apparently I asked Greg to put the hip-hop list on and it started playing and I felt like I I was, there were drills mm. to the side of my head. I was like, yeah, this off. Like, why is this playing? And so he's like, <laughs> he's like trying to turn it off. <laughs> and then, so then he put on the nice playlist and our wedding song started playing. Oh God. And I started to cry and I was like, I don't want to have the baby. I just want to be back at our wedding dancing. And the, the nurse was like, wow, it's a little late for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, did not work for labor. Well, actually, yeah. nothing worked for labor. But yeah, it definitely works when I'm running. It gets me yeah. like makes me feel like I'm bad. Yeah, you got the power. You got the power. Yeah, she's got the power. <laughs> and you're right, the stride too. It really helps when you've got a good beat that like yeah. your body can actually like bounce to. Right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Totally. Right now we're in about two feet of snow. So there is no running happening. I know but. that's what ours, I also live on a hill and it's like, oh, I can't go out there without my ice cleats on basically. And then yeah. I'm like, Same. next week will be warmer. And I'm like, okay, good. I can finally get out again. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, that's exactly me too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, what brings you joy in your creative life? I think humor. Mm. Um. When I, I was also told in art school not to put humor in my work, that I wouldn't mm. be taken seriously. The direct quote was, um, look, it's bad enough that you're a woman, um, but if you actually put humor in your work too, you'll never be taken seriously. Mm. The thing where the joy has come uh, when I actually started making again uh, is embracing humor because mm-hmm. it's 90% of who I am is laughing. You know, one of my favorite things is laughing so hard that no noise is coming out. And <laughs> yes. it just hurts. Like that is one of my favorite things. And um, I, I just love that so much. And and if you can if you can be finding like the humor, like I think that's why my spells are funny. That's why mm-hmm. you know. And it's just like I just and, and embracing the humor and not taking it so seriously, and therefore making the art I want to make that sounds like me mm-hmm. brings me a lot of joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that Side making note, the art that sounds like me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that itself making the art that sounds like me. That's like a beautiful prompt too. Like, what is the art that mm-hmm. sounds like you? Like your truest yeah. self. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Also, humor is such an accessibility thing too. Like when you can bring someone in through the through the like scope of humor, and then that, like you said at the show, like the humor allows you to say what you want to say, but also not like the, it allows somebody to not be offended or on the defense first. Yeah. yeah. Even a few of the men that like read it and were like, oh, like they knew <laughs> that it was about them, right? You yeah. Know? They were like, and then they'd look over at me and they'd be like, kind of like <laughs> laugh and shrug. And I was yeah. like, yeah. That about you. And he's like, yeah, maybe I could do that less, you know? And like, yeah. it, it was actually really good. One of my favorite things, like, and these girls never ended up talking to me. They didn't realize I was the artist, but um, she read one thing and she was like, oh my God, it's fucking Kevin. And she's like, you guys. <laughs> Kevin so now I really want to do a piece about Kevin <laughs> totally you just need to like yeah. I can't wait like there should be a oh my god because you could have that original piece and then like an arrow that's like that's Kevin. yeah, fucking, oh my god, Kevin. yeah. fucking Kevin <laughs> well you know one thing that came out see here's my here's my tangent but one a really cool thing that came out of it was um there's an artist named Mando Marie you know mm, 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 mm. oh Mando. my god I love her her Instagram handle is um see you through it okay all one word see you through it amanda okay. amanda murray um and she does these really cool like they're kind of like graffiti but fairy tale-ish like oh she was i think the second person i ever wrote about when i started jealous curator mm -hmm. she was the re one of the reasons i started it because mm. i was obsessed with her and so mm. jealous anyway we i've had her on my podcast which i no longer have but mm -hmm. and i've had her in some of my books and but we've never met mm -hmm. and she was at scope in miami uh, and so I got to meet her and we hugged and hugged like like as mm -hmm. though we'd known each other for years and so she was and she's so successful and talented and prolific and whatever and so she's looking at but she's very quiet mm -hmm. super shy mm -hmm. um there's no documentation of us meeting because neither of us wanted our pictures taken <laughs> and um she's reading the spells and I was telling her the thing about you know that I'd written down just say the stuff Mm -hmm. you know in Venice and she's like I think you need to say it louder like she's like why mm -hmm. aren't these text pieces like mm -hmm. how many people this weekend missed yeah. missed the point because they didn't lean in and read the brass plate mm -hmm. she's like I think these should be huge text mm -hmm. pieces mm -hmm. and I almost started crying because I was like mm -hmm. oh you're right like I'm saying this stuff quietly mm -hmm. and I kind of need to say it louder and mm -hmm. so that's one of the things I'm experimenting in the mm -hmm. studio with right now is what kind of type and you know is it made mm -hmm. out of gold chain is it made out of clay is it god forbid paint you know like what yeah. what how do I do those pieces but I just really appreciated like mm -hmm. that I consider feedback I don't yeah. consider that critique right like it was yeah. such good feedback yeah. she's like, I think you need to say it louder she's like it's hilarious but it's also a really good fucking point, you know? Yeah. And she's like, you need to say it out loud. And and I was like, yeah. I hugged her again. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying yeah. to, I'm playing with that as well right now. Yeah. That's an interesting thought too, just as an exercise is like, how do you do what you do at different sort of, I don't know if the word is amplitudes or what I, I think it's amplitudes. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, what is it like when it's quiet? What is it like when it's medium? What is it like when it's loud? And like, what do those yeah. three things look like? Or yeah, something? does a does medium change? Does the execution change? Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel thinking about saying something louder? Like, how yeah. do you, you know, right? That's, huge That's my problem. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It, was, it was big enough that I said it on little brass plates. Okay. Yeah. This is just like, <laughs> The Canadian in me, I just want to put a little thing underneath it that says, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Good picture, like a Here's show called, syrup. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a show called sorry. And then everything's a big ass bla brass plaque with like these things <laughs> yeah. screaming on it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that's where I am. <laughs> sharing, my, oh. sharing my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember where the question was. That's anyway. okay. Joy and creative yeah. life. And that was definitely great. So the last one is my creativity is. Oh, you sent me that ahead of time. And I had a really hard time thinking of that. I, the first thing that came to mind was like breathing. Mm. Like my creativity is like, I, I don't think I could live without it. Like it's mm. just, yeah. I need to have it in my life or I don't feel like myself. So it's just like, it's like, it's my air, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. It's my air. <laughs> Thank you for today. Sometimes I choke on it, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I, lo- I see this is like when we met years ago and I was like, I will make her my friend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a mutual <laughs> response. <laughs> it was very reciprocated. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, I could like, we were at two hours now. I could, this could be a five hour episode and we still wouldn't cover all the things. No, we wouldn't, but it's no. so like, it's just, thank you. Like you're, I mean, this is why I liked you when I first met you, like you have an openness about you and you are, oh, someone described it to me recently. And I love this expression fully round. Like somebody is fully round. Mm-hmm. Like you, you see their whole selves. They bring their whole selves with them everywhere. And like that, I love that and recognize that in you. So. Well, thank you. And I, I think that's how, especially in these situations where I feel comfortable and safe and whatever I think that's when you get somewhere right like Mm -hmm. when you can actually really say all those things like I could have come on here and like just talked about my books and my Mm -hmm. TED talk and Mm -hmm. you know and and tried to be fancy but Mm -hmm. I think it's so much more valuable to me I mean like everything that I got out I mean I've got so many notes I'm so excited to go to the studio and then the listeners are going to get so much more out of it if we're just honest and be like, yeah, yeah I'm in therapy because I cannot figure this shit out. Like yeah. so many people just assume that the jealous curator, oh, we've got these books and this and that, like mm-hmm. I've got it all figured out. It's like, you guys, I do not have it figured out. Mm. And that's part of the journey. I think if I yeah. figure it out, then what? Yeah. Then what, what is that? It's like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Gold star. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I kind of don't want to figure it out. That's part of the whole thing about, you mm-hmm. know, being a creative, well, being a human, but also being a creative human is like mm-hmm. the, the journey keeps going. And so I think the, the, the more honest we are about it with each other, or, mm-hmm. you know, I always say like to find your people, even if your people is one people, you mm-hmm. know, that you talk with on Fridays over a coffee on zoom mm-hmm. and have these real conversations where you're like, this is hard. And the other person yeah. goes, well, but maybe, you know, the fire is the alchemy. And when you put all these things together and you're like, oh, Mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. I just had so many aha moments in this conversation alone mm-hmm. you know what I mean and yeah I, I do can, totally yeah. just yesterday someone gave me something for my work and I was like thank you we were on a work meeting and they're like I've been watching this practice you do and I just here's something I was thinking about and I was like, thank you so much I could just yeah. you know yeah it's, it's just valuable it's, that, it, they're gifts the oh man such silos right yes you, you well, you and I like both live real- in rural areas, but and work in our solo spaces. So it's like extra, yeah. di- like you extra work at getting out and meeting people and doing things and yeah. having conversations yeah. when you're in that situation. And you have to, and you have to let the ego go and you have yeah. to let the Instagram um, yeah. mask come off and just be real. And that's when you have the real breakthroughs and the real conversations. And I think they are just yeah. invaluable. Yeah, agree. That's the gold. Yeah. Agree. This week, let's be inspired by Danielle and think about the stuff we want to say in our art, writing, and creative practice. What do you want to say? How would you say it louder? What does that look like? Dig into Danielle's breadth of work from her seven books, including two children's books, How to Spot an Artist and Art and Joy, Best Friends Forever, to her TEDx Nashville talk, How to Cut Creativity Out of Your Life, and to her witty and expressive art. This May, she will have a solo show at Gen Tuff Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Check it out if you're there. And if you dream of learning from her in an in-person workshop and traveling to Venice, Italy, you're in luck. There are still spots available for her workshop for July 15th through the 26th of 2024, which is hosted by the European Cultural Academy. A link to register is found in the show notes for this episode on this podcast's website, the artist in me is dead podcast.com and on Danielle's Instagram accounts at Danielle Chrissa art and at the jealous curator. If you enjoy the podcast, please share it and rate and review wherever you listen. If you are new to the podcast, be sure to check out season one and other season two episodes, wherever you listen. As always, thank you so much for joining me. Bye. <laughs>